family, and welcome back to the Explore the Extraordinary podcast. My name is Betty Guadagno, and today I am joined by Father Nathan Castle. And so I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast. Um, Father Nathan is joined by his assistant, Toto, and uh, very grateful for that as well. And Father Nathan's been involved with IONS conferences and doing service work for us, sharing and speaking and raising the vibration of the consciousness of the collective. So I'm really excited that you uh, you agreed to be on the podcast and I'm going to toss it right over to you to uh, share about your experiences. Thanks so much for being here. Sure. Well, I am Father Nathan Castle. I'm a, a, a Dominican priest. I've um, been a campus minister much of my career and I currently live on the campus of the University of Arizona in Tucson. I, uh, In fact, I helped out a lot there this weekend uh, but my full-time work is writing and uh, podcasting now, public speaking, mostly on the topic of uh, of afterlife and especially experiences that I've had over the last 27 years of helping souls that reach out to me that needed some assistance in the afterlife, especially people whose death came suddenly and violently. Um, it, it appears that... Uh, that, you know, when we go to a funeral and people often uh, will say things like, well, now uh, mom and dad are back together or he's on the first tee in heaven or he's with his poker buddies or whatever. We we have an idea of joys and experiences that will be fresh and new and happy. Um, but, uh, but for some people that die suddenly and violently, they're just not ready for that quite yet. <laughs> They'll get there, but they need a moment to decompress or maybe more than a moment. And sometimes they need to go through uh, different kinds of healing and forgiveness processes, or they, they need to come to greater truth about themselves. And so they reach a certain level where they're ready to move along. And my partners and I are kind of like the discharge staff in a medical center. You've healed to the point where you don't need to be here any longer, uh, but somebody like a social worker helps you collect your things and understand, make sure you understand your physical therapy or your next appointment or that somebody's coming to pick you up. Uh, our job is to kind of help people move along. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, um how do, how does this process work for you? Like, how do these souls kind of reach out to you? They come in dreams. In fact, I had one last night. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always been, I think, pretty good at remembering dreams. Most mornings, if you were to ask me over coffee, did you have any dreams last night? I'd have something to tell you. But, uh, but there's a different kind. I, I say, um, I use this language. I had a dream about my own psychobabble. I received a dream that was someone else's information, someone else's experience. And uh, that started about 10 years ago. They come about, I call them my night visitors. They come about once a week. They do their best not to terrorize me in my sleep, even if the way in which they died was awful. They show me just the basics of it to get the main idea without uh, a lot of gore. And, uh, after that, I write it down in a notebook that I keep on the nightstand. I have regular appointments with prayer partners in different parts of the country. Uh, when we get together, we go into what I call protected prayer. Um, I don't pick up hitchhikers on this earth or on any other plane. Uh, I protect myself and our and my partners first. I'm a Christian. I use uh, uh, the the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the persons of God, the, the Mary, the mother of Jesus, St. Michael, the Archangel, uh, St. Benedict. There's a number of different, I'm always in a big huddle of spiritual protectors. And then once we've done that, we get to work. I read to my partners, uh, mostly on Zoom. Uh, the pandemic kind of changed that. Before the pandemic, I did almost all of these in person. And when we learned how uh, easily it worked on Zoom, that just opened up uh, a lot of other possibilities. So we, um, I read the story as I wrote it down after the protective prayer. And then we've kind of evolved a, to pretty much asking their guardian angel. Now people in IONS might call that spirit guides or beings of light or whatever. I just stick with guardian angel because it works. 
And we uh, we ask for the guardian to provide some clarity because the nature of uh, dream stories has some uh, vagueness or ambiguity about it uh, in general. So there might be archetypical images or, for example, someone might show me that they died in, in a car crash, but they didn't tell me their gender. Well, I'd kind of like to know if I'm talking to a man or a woman. Sometimes I feel like I might be in a country other than the United States. And so I like to ask about that. So we get a little bit of clarity. Uh, and it's also a little bit like a mic test. You and I at the beginning of this call really didn't do much of anything like that. All we did was go on Zoom and it worked. But uh, because you're a podcaster and so am I, you know, that that's not always the case. And sometimes you're fiddling around with connectivity uh, and so sometimes with the guardians, uh, we call it a mic test because they're going to borrow my voice most of the time. I have a few partners that also can allow their voice to be used by another person. and um, But most of the time, uh, it's my voice. So the guardian comes through. We're co-conscious. I'm not entranced. Um, I'm not frightened. Uh, it's delightful, really. And they borrow my voice long enough to, to, uh, to, to give a, a little bit of clarity and then normally will say, now the one that I guard and love will be the next uh, uh, voice to speak. And they'll, they call it sliding to the side. They say, we'll be here and support you in prayer, but I'll slide to the side so that the one that I guard and love can speak. And then the person who brought the dream story uh, emerges and they engage with my prayer partners and they talk back and forth. I'm in, I'm in the background. I'm, I'm conscious of all of it. They can only, uh, even if they don't speak English, they say, I, I never learned English, but all I have to do is form my thoughts and they come out in English. Um, they can only use words that are in my vocabulary. Um, sometimes they'll use a phrase of mine and say, I've never used that word before. Like English speakers will, will say, I've never, I've never said that before, but it works. And, uh, and then we go into just a, a, a short conversation about what happened to them what they've been doing that's prepared them for this day when they're ready to move along. So I'm curious why well, I'm curious about a lot of things, but um, so how did this come about? Like, how did you, ha were you scared when you first started to experience this? You were already walking in a lot of faith. So you were open to it. it um, when I speak publicly, I usually spend the first 10 to 12 minutes describing my childhood as a little Catholic kid because it wasn't just rules and regulations that I learned. And I don't have Catholic guilt. You know, I just learned spiritual practice. My mom understood that when I was really small that I loved pirates. And I had a book uh, that had records that I could listen to before I could read that matched the pictures in the book and the record lived inside the book in a little sleeve. And there was a picture of a desert island with a palm tree and a broken boat. and a crab and it had a dotted line with an X. And I learned very early that X marks the spot where the treasure's buried. And I was taught to make the sign of the cross like a little child. And she said, what letter is that? I was learning the alphabet. Well, it's an X. Well, that's because X marks the spot in your heart where the treasure's buried. And that treasure is God who loves you. So anytime you wanna to talk to your other family, I was taught that I lived on two planes uh, I lived on earth with an earthly family, but I also have a heavenly family. So I was learning this as a three-year-old, four-year-old. Uh, and so I would knock on my heart and say, hello, and there I want to talk to you. And then I learned, um, I don't know, when can you remember like at what age you learned about death, that, that people die or animals die? Yeah, I was probably very young. You know, you see a dead bird on the sidewalk, or maybe you have a pet that died, or maybe there is a relative or something that died. It's, you know, most kids get some notion of, of death fairly early on. And I learned that when he, people die, they go someplace, they go. Uh, and and in, in my early training, I was in Catholic school and kindergarten and the rest, all the way. And we learned about heaven, hell and purgatory. And that was almost like Canada, U.S. and Mexico. <laughs> they were like these nation states with borders and you went to one of them. But if you, uh, but most people weren't horrible to go to, to go straight to hell, and most people weren't perfect to go straight to heaven. That most of them went to this sort of in between place where they got uh, ready to be with God, and it matched kind of getting 
getting cleaned up and dressed for church. You know, that you were there was this process that you went through that and even purge means to cleanse. So uh, but I learned that only Catholics believed that there was this in-between space. I grew up in a town that was about half Baptist and half Catholic. So as as I began to learn how to read, I we got newspapers in the morning and in the evening. And both of them had a whole page devoted to pictures and little stories of people who had died, obituaries. And once I learned enough uh, about how to read, I'd look all the way to the bottom because it would say what church the funeral was going to be in. And in the 60s, when I was growing up, nobody had a celebration of life in a park or in a backyard. All the funerals were at a church. So uh, you, I, I, I figured that the people, I was taught that the, that Catholics only pray for their souls in purgatory, and the other people didn't know to do that. So I would pray for anybody that wasn't a Catholic. And so that was my little job. Wow. So, okay. A, a couple more questions about what it is that you describe that you're doing now. Do you yeah. think that other people have access to be able to assist souls in shepherding? I do. And in fact, somewhere in the next year, I think I'd like to do some sort of a webinar, or some, some at least gathering of people because people find me after interviews like this one and say, oh my God, there's another one. You know, somebody else is like me. And they might be from all over the map in terms of, you know, religion, spirituality, philosophy, and the experiences they have are uh, not always in dreams at night. There are lots of different ways that people are felt feel contacted. So yeah, I've met, and hanging around Ions, you know, you, you when you go to an Ions conference, you meet everybody's everything. So yeah, there's, this work is done by lots of people in lots of ways. Beautiful. Um, yeah, that might be something fun for us to do on the online platform at IONS. And, and we'll talk about that after that would um, be fun. setting up. Yeah, that would be really cool because it seems really fascinating, you know, this whole this whole concept. So I'm curious if maybe you can share a little bit about your own spiritual journey, how you came into this awareness. Do you still have those same views of heaven, hell and purgatory? Or I know that you had a spiritually transformative experience in your 20s, right? Uh, yeah, more than one, but, um, well, I had one at 18 where I, um, kind of acknowledged that I closed my heart to my dad. I got angry with him and just protected myself by shutting down inside. And, uh, I, I had an experience at a Catholic retreat right before graduating high school. First time I'd ever been on a retreat. And they just asked us to tell the truth about our families. What's it like to be in your family? And, I didn't know that if I'd known that that was what the retreat was going to be about, I probably wouldn't have gone on it, <laughs> but I did. And so I watched other people tell the truth about growing up in their family. And the teen years are notoriously difficult, even for people like me that was in an intact, happy marriage and, you know, no, no abuse of any kind. It was, I, I just uh, got angry with my dad and shut down. And and then it was about time to go off to college. And I thought, I'm never going to come back here except as a visitor. I need to do this leaving correctly. I need to do it right. And so on this retreat, I told the truth. And um, I, I, I went to communion at, at the mass that concluded it. And I had what some people would call the baptism, the Holy Spirit, the Pentecost, Kundalini, uh, Huge energy, uh, a sense of boundarylessness, of belonging to everything all at once, feeling supremely loved. A lot of I'm, I haven't had an NDE, but most NDE experiencers talk about feeling surrounded or flooded in love, and that was true. It was enough to make me know that whatever I did with the rest of my life, I wanted it to be about this, uh, uh, and so. Um, yeah, and, and and then I had an ex the first experience of speaking through uh, of my voice being borrowed was at the Grand Canyon when I was graduating college. My best friend and I, um, we knew that our lives would probably go different directions. And we thought, we've been such good friends. Let's end it on a high note. Let's go out into the desert and seek God's will for us. Because he was going to be a Presbyterian minister, was, was getting cold feet. And I was thinking about maybe being a priest, but I wasn't sure. Anyway, and he was also about to get engaged, but he hadn't asked his girlfriend yet. And so we we sought out God's will and went from San Antonio, where we were in college, uh, and camped along the way, all the way to the Grand Canyon. And when we got there, we sat down on the edge of the canyon to pray. And when we did, 
uh, that was the first time the voice speaking through manifested. And I thought, well, when I, when it's when that impulse started to me, I thought, well, geez, that's what my friend is here for. He wanted to hear a message from God. And that's what seemed like it was happening. And I had to decide, is this legitimate? Is it the devil? Is it my ego? Is it some stupid craziness? And I just said, you know, I told the Lord, I said, I'll give you the count of 10 to, to stop this because my answer is yes, I will do this for you. Uh, but you 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 need to stop me if you don't want me to do it. And when I got down to, to 10 or to zero, I think I kind of down, um, I was flooded with love. And, and I said, go ahead. And inside the voice said, what do you think the first thing I want to say to him is? It was up to me. I thought, well, what would God want to say to anybody? What do you think? I love you. What else could it be? It had to be that. And, you know, we were two guys. We were best friends, but I'd never said I love you in, in one sentence. I mean, it was true. And so I thought, well, you know, I could do that. And so I did. I just looked. I, I had my eyes closed, but I opened my eyes and looked at him. And now he knew something was up. And he, he was like wide eyed. And I said, Matt, I love you. And as soon as I said that, this whole that, you know, when they call it channeling, it, that's a kind of radioactive word in the church. And so I don't use it very often. Um, but um, but it felt like a canal. It felt like a channel of energy and grace. And it was God, the creator, speaking to him, uh, reminiscing about what fun it was to create him. Uh, thoughts I had never really had, but I was had been an art student and it was touching the most creative parts of me and the joy of making something and have it come out beautifully and Anyway, it went on and on, and in, in the it went on for about 20 minutes. And in the course of it, uh, the creator addressed my friend Matt as Milton. But I was busy, and I just thought, okay, I'll hold that off to the side. But when it was, when it was all over, uh, we debriefed it a bit, and I said, what was that part about Milton? And he said, well, that was the fifth grade. And I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, well, I was on the playground and kids started mocking my name and telling me it was stupid. And his, I didn't know his name was Milton. Um, he said, I went home and I sat on the edge of my bed and in the afternoon and before I went down to dinner, I decided that I needed a different name, one that was cool. And so he decided to be Matt. And he made an announcement at the dinner table to his family that from now on, my name is Matt. And, but the creator called him Milton. Wow, that is such amazing confirmation, right? If there was it, any it, any thought in your mind that maybe I'm making this up, something like that is just absolute confirmation that it's got to be true. I was so grateful, you know, because <laughs> I had taken a risk and uh, I didn't know that. So. Wow, that is amazing. Do you have any more kind of stories like that about the confirmation? I think that so many people... Um, and thank you for using the word channeling, because as you were describing it, I was like, oh, OK, he's a channel. Uh, but so many people fear that, you know, I, I think that, you know, they think, oh, is it just me? Am I doing this? Am I actually receiving these thoughts? Do you have any more stories of kind of this, you know, very intense confirmation that what is happening is true? Well, one, before we leave the, the idea of channel, for one thing, do you know that the, the uh, prayer of St. Francis in the Catholic tradition, and it's off, often sung, make me a channel of your peace. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong about channels. In Spanish, it's just canal. It, it's, it's, a, it's something that contains an energy, you know, a flow, a current. And so there's, the issue becomes, is this a holy current or an unholy one? That's, what, that's where that comes into play. And as I said earlier, I do everything I can to protect myself and those who are around me. And I'm a follower of Jesus. He, he told us, don't, don't be afraid. Um, you know, do reasonable things to uh, be cautious, but then do what you do your job, do what needs doing. So, so yeah, that, let, let, we can put that to rest. Uh, other confirmation things. Um, uh, there have been a number of them. I have, um, I don't know, they're, they're, I'm not free to speak of all of them. Uh, but I'm about to start moving in the direction of what gets called verification, which is your question. Can you verify? Can you prove that the people that you claim to 
uh, work with, can you produce stuff like death certificates or or marriage licenses? And kind of this kind of the stuff that people on Ancestry.com do, where they they get data points of some kind to show that this person is who they uh, who they claim to be. I'm I'm working with a guy who has expertise in that field, and I hope to be doing more of that in uh, in years to come. That's really cool. Yeah, I think that, I mean, there's so many skeptics. I think even people in spiritual communities can kind of be skeptical at times just to sort of see things from both ends. But I mean, you know, it's, I think it's about really about walking in faith. Maybe you want, do you want to speak a little bit to that? Well, uh, you and I are adults and we've spoken and listened to people for all our lives. And we're always free to believe what we hear or not always and um and then how much do you need some how much evidence do you need to produce in order for someone to take your word for it you know and and that that appetite is going to differ if you talk to 10 people in a room that appetite is going to be different in each of the 10 and so uh again i'm a follower of jesus jesus had all kind of claims that he had to that he spoke about but he didn't chase down every last person and, you know, persuade them. Uh, he just spoke his truth. And I believe that's what I do. I just tried to say. And my training, undergraduate training was in um, sociology and social science. So I know how the social sciences operate. And as an observer, when in, in a social scientific uh, model, you you decide, you create something like an experiment. You want to observe human behavior under a certain set of controlled circumstances. And then after you observe and you create a data pool of, of things that you observed, you're supposed to just say what you observed, give the data. If you want to have an opinion about it, you're supposed to label that as a second step. You can be a good social scientist by just uh, creating a data set of of uh, information and let the viewer, the listener, the reader make their own assessment of it. Or you can help them by saying, after having done this experiment, I believe thus and so. So in my books, I record all of our sessions on an app on my phone. I get them translated by, now it's AI, uh, but I get them almost right away. I clean up the transcripts of just stammers, ums and ahs, um, because it's, it can be annoying to read uh, what we've spoken out loud. Uh, I'd clean them up just a little bit. And then the, of the stories, I don't tell any of the stories publicly without going back to the person whose story it is and asking their permission to use it. Um, I don't chat up people who have died and I don't call them dead because nobody stays dead. You know, uh, they die, but then they live on uh, in a different way. And so I don't think of myself as talking to the dead. I'm talking to someone who has died. Uh, oh, I love that. I love that reframing and that language. Thank you for that. I think so, it's important. Yeah, it, it is really important. Our words are very important. So you had said something about making sure that you use protective prayers before yeah. you go into this process. And I'm wondering if maybe, is there an experience where, like when you were first starting doing this, you didn't know maybe to do that? Have you had like a negative experience that you feel like you need to use these protective prayers? No, no, no. That that's was early childhood training. I, I understood, you know, um, parents, I haven't had, I, I've, I've been a campus minister and I don't have children of my own, but I've been putting the finishing touches on other people's kids for most of my life. But I didn't have to raise little ones. But one of the challenges of raising little ones is to instill in them that the world is a beautiful place, full of beautiful people, but you also have to teach them about stranger danger. Uh, that not everybody has your good, uh, your interests at heart, and some people might harm you if they were given the opportunity. So that's a delicate balancing act. But anyway, I, I um, no, I understood that as a child that that on this plane and on the spiritual plane that one needed to be wary. Um, and uh, do you know the difference between servile fear and wariness? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm trained in, in uh, Aristotle and, and uh, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, um, when, when 
when when in scripture we hear fear not, it usually is about what's called servile fear, which is what bullies try to inspire in you. If you've ever been bullied, the bullying person is trying to rob you of your freedom. They're trying to steal your freedom from you and make you subservient to them. You will be under my thumb because I want you to be. Um, uh, if you don't do what I want or else, uh, some sort of threat. That's servile fear. And we're, we're told to, be, be, to avoid that um, and stand up to it. But uh, the other kind is wariness. One time, I've, I've hardly ever lived where it snows a lot. But I was at Stanford and some of my students were going up into the mountains to ski and I had to stay back and be in a car by myself and drive myself through snow. And I I did the chains badly and all but one of them fell off. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was on this snowy mountain road at, at night. Well, I was wary. I, I, it, I was afraid because I was in a fearsome circumstance. But wariness helped me rally and pay attention uh, on high alert to make sure I did everything I possibly could to get to safety. So I'm wary where uh, where I'm where I do this work, uh, and so part of wariness is starting with protection. That's all, and then after I've done that, I feel like you know I buckled my seatbelt. <laughs> I, I did the thing that I needed to do to be safer. I wore my mask in the airport. <laughs> I'm going. I'm be traveling in the next few days and. And I'm I'm masking up. And I've got my shots. And <laughs> anyway, wariness is important. Thanks for that distinction. I have never heard those two types of things before. So now kind of maybe some of the misinterpretation of the Bible makes a little bit more sense to me. Um, kind of that different. We all know how to be wary right. without having a kind of a, I don't know, some sort of a panicky you know, fear about us. We're just, there are circumstances where you just uh, are wary because there's good reason to be. Right, yeah. Wow. Um, another question. So if you had to sum up your faith now, I mean, like obviously you shared about being raised Catholic. Is that still, um, like that's still the main teaching that you go by or have you exercised yeah. open, go ahead. I'll let you. Well, um, the word Catholic, I'm a big, I'm big on words and etymologies. Uh, kata, K-A-T-A in Greek means to, according to or about. And holon, the second half of the word, means wholeness, oneness. And so uh, to be a Catholic person means to be a part of the whole. Uh, so not just a sectarian religious group, but of the whole universe. And so um, I practice as a, as a, a Catholic. We're, the, we're still the largest membership organization on the whole planet. And we have all kinds of problems and troubles and things, uh, but, you know, I'm just doing the best I can. Yeah. Uh, same thing. It, it's a membership organization, but so is being a U.S. citizen. Sometimes I'm very proud of that and other times not so much, depending upon what we're doing. Uh, I love being a part of my family, mostly, except not always. <laughs> uh, think of Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> you know. Uh, I just I, I try to to accept and love uh, uh, and practice my Catholic faith uh, without it being something that is, I don't know, exclusive or uh, judgmental. I really like that because I hear so much open mindedness in what you're talking about. And sometimes when I think about re religion, I think of it as like a very rigid box. But now I'm listening to you and you're expanding my own awareness because I don't hear that when you're talking. It, it can be that, but it needn't be. You know? Right. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, I really appreciate you taking time to come and, and share with our community. And I'm I'm pretty sure that maybe we'll be able to have a link underneath us of, of when we can do that workshop, because I think that would be really cool. Um, I just want to see if there's anything else that you'd like to share to feel more complete about our time together today. Sure. Well, the, the, uh, the work that we do with individual souls that come in the night is described in two books, Afterlife Interrupted, books one and two. Those are available on Amazon as eBooks, paper books, or Audible books, which my prayer partners and I have voiced it in our own voices. I have another book on that, a third book in that series coming out before the end of the year. Uh, the first book was, ooh, here it is, Product Placement, and Toto 2, The Wizard of Oz is a Spiritual Adventure, 
This is my buddy Toto. Uh, and uh, I, I also have a podcast of my own called The Joyful Friar. I'm a friar and our founder, St. Dominic, that was his nickname. So I asked his permission to use it. He said, sure, go ahead. So uh, those are the main ways that I commune uh, with the world. I, my website is nathan-castle.com and I'm pretty good about trying to reply to email inquiries that come through there. Um, and then I'm excited that Ian's next convention is in Arizona and that's where I live. So uh, maybe at some of uh, people who hear this, it's always open to the public. You don't have to be a member of Ian's to attend uh, and it'll be uh, in South Phoenix. And so uh, come see us. That's awesome. Yes, definitely looking forward to the, the next conference and and all of your links will be in the liner notes of this episode. So I just want to thank you again so much for coming out and sharing and expanding my awareness. And I'm sure everybody that's listening as well. So thanks so okay. much. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.